In this video, we're going to analyze Disney's financial statements. We'll break down Disney's different revenue sources and analyze its profitability, including its margins and rates of return. We'll also look at Disney's cash flow and its business segments. Let's start with Disney's income statement, specifically focusing on top line revenue growth, margins, and earnings. Total revenue has been increasing with a compound annual growth rate of 4.5%. You can see that Disney breaks out revenue separately by products and services. Growth was a little higher for product revenue than it was for service revenue, but service revenue was the elephant in the room and accounted for nearly 90% of Disney's total revenue. We'll dive deeper into these revenue streams later when we discuss Disney's business segments. The gross margins for products and services were pretty similar and both experienced an upward trend. The increased gross margin for Disney as a whole was driven largely by a decrease in programming and production costs as a percentage of revenue for the sports, direct-to-consumer, and content sales and licensing segments. In short, revenue increased, but the cost of producing that revenue didn't go up by as much. Moving to the bottom of the income statement, we can see that earnings per share more than doubled in a single year. Disney's earnings growth was strong but not as strong as it seems because the earnings per share was inflated by a one-time income tax benefit. Disney's effective tax rate was actually negative due to a nearly 3.3 billion one-time tax benefit that occurred when Disney paid Comcast NBC Universal to acquire complete control of Hulu. As a result, Disney's effective tax rate went from 23.7% the year before to negative 11.9%. This one-time tax benefit increased Disney's earnings by $1.55 a share, and a resolution of a prior year tax matter increased the earnings by an additional 56 cents a share. Removing those benefits results in earnings per share of $4.77 instead of the $6.88 that Disney reported. This is still an improvement over the prior year's earnings, but not nearly as much. Now let's turn to the balance sheet, where we can look at Disney's liquidity and long-term solvency. Disney's current ratio and quick ratio both declined, but this wasn't due to financial problems. Cash decreased because Disney started paying dividends and making share repurchases again. Thus, Disney wasn't experiencing cash flow problems just because its cash balance declined. In fact, Operating cash flow increased, as well as the ratio of operating cash flow to current liabilities. Disney also reduced its debt, with long-term debt as a percentage of total assets decreasing and interest coverage increasing. Thus, Disney's long-term solvency improved. Next, we can calculate rates of return using figures from both the balance sheet and the income statement. Disney's return on assets was low, even though the company had a decent profit margin because its asset turnover was low. Disney generated less than 50 cents of revenue for every dollar of assets. This low asset turnover might be due in part to 37% of Disney's assets being goodwill. Remember that goodwill is simply the premium paid for another company in an acquisition. Thus, Goodwill isn't being used to drive revenue like the equipment from Disney's parks. Now Disney's return on common equity is nearly double that of its return on assets. This is because the return on common equity increases with financial leverage when the company is profitable. The bad news is that Disney's return on common equity is lower than its cost of equity by my estimates. Ideally, the return on common equity should exceed the cost of equity, because that means the company is creating value for its common shareholders. Next, let's look at Disney's cash flow statement. Operating cash flow increased every year with a compound annual growth rate of 34.3%. That's terrific and is one of the strongest aspects of Disney's financial performance. Disney used the increased cash flow to pay down some of its debt resume paying dividends, and start making share repurchases. Disney also reinvested some of that cash back in its business, with capital expenditures increasing both in total dollar amount and as a percentage of revenue. So far, we focused on financial figures for Disney as a whole, but Disney makes money from multiple business units. 
So now we're gonna dive deeper and look at the financial results for Disney's component parts. Disney reported three segments, entertainment, sports, and experiences. But it further split the entertainment segment into three parts, linear networks, direct-to-consumer, and content sales and licensing. That makes five business units in total. Linear networks includes ABC, as well as channels like National Geographic and FX, while direct-to-consumer includes Disney Plus and Hulu. Content sales and licensing includes revenue from theatrical distribution, movies, and the licensing of Disney Media. Sports includes ESPN, while experiences includes theme parks, cruises, and resorts. Disney reported revenue and operating margins for each of these five business units, which is really helpful in terms of understanding which activities drove Disney's revenue and profitability. Linear Networks had the highest operating margin of all five business units, but Linear Networks is clearly in decline as consumers shift away from network and cable television. Both the operating margin and total profit of this business unit have declined, and that's been driven by double-digit declines in revenue. The direct-to-consumer business unit, on the other hand, has experienced double-digit increases in revenue growth. Its subscription revenue grew by 11%, primarily due to price increases, but also due to increases in the number of paid subscribers for Disney Plus and Hulu. This business unit was once experiencing losses, but it's since become profitable due to a decrease in programming and production costs and SG&A as a percentage of revenue. These costs are largely fixed, so there's significant profit potential if Disney can continue to grow revenue for its direct-to-consumer business unit. However, Continuing to grow revenue might be challenging as Disney Plus and Hulu face lots of competition. Thus, a key question is whether the direct-to-consumer business unit can one day achieve the operating margins that the linear networks business unit enjoyed for so many years. When it comes to content sales and licensing, there have been significant fluctuations in revenue. This business unit had both the lowest profit and the lowest margin of all five business units. Revenue for sports was flat, and its profitability was in the middle of the pack for the five business units. But the experiences business unit was hands down the main driver of profitability for Disney. It created the majority of Disney's profit, and it boasted the second highest operating margin. This margin has been stable over time, with increases in labor costs being offset by decreases in cost of goods sold and distribution costs. The compound annual growth rate of revenue for the experiences unit was 6.5%, and this was driven primarily due to revenue growth from resorts and vacations and theme park admissions. Tying everything together, we can see that the future profitability and cash flow of Disney hinges on whether its direct-to-consumer business unit can continue to increase its operating margin and replace the declining linear networks business unit by becoming a significant profit center. Disney can also grow profit by continuing to grow top line revenue for its very profitable experiences business unit. Remember that this is a turnaround situation. Bob Iger was rehired as CEO in November of 2022 after the company had suspended dividend payments and share repurchases. The increased operating cash flow since that time is a great sign is it's enabled Disney to pay off some of its debt, thereby strengthening its balance sheet, and resume paying dividends. If Disney can continue to grow its operating cash flow, this would facilitate continued investment in its theme parks, as well as the potential for dividend increases and even more share repurchases. But Disney needs to replace the declining profits of its linear networks business unit, ideally by continuing to scale up Disney Plus and Hulu. I hope you found this video helpful. If you'd like to see the spreadsheet I created in making this video, you can become a supporter on Patreon.